Continuing our coverage from the 2024 Mass uh, Torts uh, Conference in uh, Las Vegas from the Wynn Hotel. I am in a conference room uh, and uh, out of the um, uh, the exhibitor hall. Uh, but joining me now is uh, Tommy James from Tommy James Law in uh, Alabama. Yes, sir. Uh, whereabouts in Alabama? We're in Birmingham. Uh, in Birmingham. And... Um, just give me a sense of like what, uh, how long have you been a, a trial lawyer and what kind of cases have you generally uh, covered? Yeah, I used to, I've been practicing for about 27 years and started off doing the usual kind of things, car wrecks and, you know, truck wrecks and some products liabilities cases, and then kind of started suing the state in personal injury cases. Uh, suing state employees, and I uh, had a couple of really, really bad cases where individuals were at state facilities for people with mental disabilities and physical disabilities, developmental disabilities, and um, had some success there, wrongful death cases, some horrible sexual assault cases. And then probably about 20 years ago, it kind of morphed into representing um young people who are institutionalized, right or wrong, um, not prison type cases, but when they're placed into residential facilities, psychiatric facilities, hospitals, uh, sometimes um, penitent not penitentiary, but some places for troubled kids who have been adjudicated in juvenile court uh, and, and just saw the horrible things that was going on in these places. And um, so kind of just took that as my calling to help these people who can't help themselves. And uh, where, where are the parents in that? In, the, in that equation? Well, it, it's kind of in these kind of cases, it's it's two parts. Um, some of the parents pl place their children in these types of facilities like therapeutic boarding schools, wilderness camps, um, things like that. If they're having behavioral issues. Um, they'll pay countless amount of money to send their children to these programs so the kids will, quote, get better. I mean, these these programs promise the parents and they manipulate the parents saying, you know, based on what you're telling us here about this child, he's on the wrong path. I mean, he's going to die if you don't do something fast. So they'll pay this ungodly amounts of money to place a kid in, in one of these types of facilities. And oftentimes, and, and this is, the thing people are shocked by is when the parents pay to place children to these places, the children don't want to go. I mean, they rarely go voluntarily. Right. So they pay what's called a transport company. Uh, but it's called gooning to basically come in the middle of the night and legally kidnap their children to take them to these facilities. And they always tell them um, when they wake the children up in the middle of the night, come into their room and say, well, you can either go the hard way or the easy way. And they have the zip ties ready to go. And oh, geez. Yeah. So most of the times they quote go the easy way. But that right there, when that that's a trauma in and of itself, that a child, you know, they're in their safest spot in their bedroom in the middle of the night. They're they'll never they'll never get over that. Um so you have the private pay that places these and you have the government pay facilities and uh, those happen more often child's place because the child and family services division of whatever state it is in Alabama, it's called DHR of uh, a child. A lot of these kids are foster children and because of bad upbringings or no, I shouldn't say that because of drugs or alcohol or something like that traumas they've had over time. Um, they'll be placed in a facility like this by the state if so they don't have a disability. So, the, so these aren't necessarily um, uh, kids of, of wealthy families. Um, uh, it, it, it sounds like it runs across the spectrum. Exa exactly. That's. I mean, do you have the places like, I'm sure we'll talk about it later, about the program on Netflix. That's one of these pri private pay places where the, the, the parents are very wealthy. There's an interesting topic uh, or they put a graphic up in that fit in that documentary saying how much it costs to go to this Ivy Ridge school in New York was more than Harvard and Ivy League schools for a yearly tuition to these places. But again, like you said, um, state med Medicaid will pay for these other children who maybe aren't wealthy in any ways and, and um, have had problems growing up and things like that. Then the state will place them in these facilities and just horrible things are going on in both, both types of facilities. Okay. So basically the easier way to say it, the, there's 
they're the same type of facilities, but some kind of cater to government money and some cater to private pay. And and we should be clear, all of these facilities are privately run. These Correct. are not these are, these are and so you've got basically entrepreneurs, and I'm oh, using yes. the word, you know, sort of uh, loosely here, who are going out and um and sometimes they're it, well uh they they're saying this is the solution. And sometimes it sounds like they're also creating a problem so that they are a solution. Right. And and you say entrepreneur, and that is the best way to describe the operators of these facilities. And Jay Ripley, he uh, founded a lot of people know across the country, a, a facility called SQL, SQL Youth and Family Services. Now, they've been put out of business now, and they're calling themselves something else, but just horrible abuses occurred in these facilities. And he, Jay Ripley, founded SQL. And prior to that, he was CEO of Jiffy Lube and things like this. And he was involved in restaurants. And I've seen some of his speeches, and we incorporate that in the, our presentations at conferences like this, where he gets up and talks about how he's such a great entrepreneur and how the government money's like a fire hose that will never go off because there'll always be problem kids and there'll always be government money. But he also says, you can't make profit unless you cut costs. And that means cut costs. And that's inevitably, you're not going to have as many employees as you should have. They're not going to be trained at all. There's going to be low wage employees. So it's all about money for regardless of it. There's a lot of private equity involved in these, oh, these facilities, Altamont's involved. There's some big players, uh, UHS universal healthcare, they're a big operator and this, they're a fortune 500 company. Um, and is there a dollar figure like when we well, talk about this class of of facilities there there is specific sort of like a class right i mean they're supposedly schools uh but they're schools for troubled teens i mean well let, talk to me about the the revenue and then i want to talk about like sort of the cohort of kids that go in there in terms of ages yeah and, and when you say school and I get sidetracked on that. School is a very loose term and education is right. very loosely used in these places. They claim to provide education and we've got some lawsuits pending down in Alabama in federal court right now. Uh, the DOJ came down to Alabama and said the children in these types of facilities are not receiving adequate education and not receiving the education that their non-disabled peers are receiving. Um, I know I kind of got off into the well. We'll get into that because that's that has to do with the the, the sort of the, some of the legal theories that you are using to protect the the rights of these kids. Um, but how much of a business? I mean, how big of a business? How many? The, the government, the the figures that the, the government is paying into this is twenty three billion a year. Wow, and that's just government funding. So it, I, I, the program it doesn't really have a good side. In that documentary, they say about, a total of it's about a fifty to sixty billion dollar industry a year. I mean, up to two hundred thousand kids are affected by this on a yearly basis. There are approximately 10,000, quote, troubled teen industry facilities in the U.S. Wow. Okay. And that includes, like I said, boot camps, boarding schools, therapeutic boarding schools, wilderness camps, um, ranches. They have all, they're called all kinds of things. And all they're, right. And they're everywhere. We should just say the, the you, you're referencing a, a couple of times, there's a, a documentary on Netflix called The Program, Cons, Cults, and Kidnapping. Uh, which apparently is uh, 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 quite a hit, and th that is a sort of a segment of the the type of things that you do in this instance. So, how how old are the kids that you have represented or that are representable? I guess I, I've got I've got a client as young as I've had clients as young as six. Uh, I've got a current client who's eleven who was beaten severely in a UHS facility on multiple occasions by staff. Oh, and the, the child services and they came down and investigated and they confirmed that it was going on. And I won't get into the games defense lawyers are playing in that game, but up to 19 up to, in, in Alabama, you're, you don't hit the age of majority until 19. Okay. And so when you've got a six year old, I mean, how do, how do you end up representing a six year old? Do, do, do the parents come to you and say like, we think there's a problem here. Well, yes. And, the, and sadly in the, the case of the six year old, um, he was sexually abused by a roommate in one of these facilities. And that's a UHS. How does a six-year-old end up in a facility like this? Like, and what, like, what is a six-year-old capable of doing that makes everybody sort of agree, like, this person needs to be sent away? It makes no sense. It made no sense to the parents of this child. The child was having issues. 
but certainly not issues Who where he should be in placed in a psychological facility. The state did. Oh, okay. I the state see. did. So there's your answer. I mean, especially in a state like Alabama is, you know, we're not, uh, well, I could say a lot of things about that, but I don't know if we want to talk about Alabama today, but um, it, it's baffling to me. It's baffling. And so, um, and so the parents will come to you in that situation and say, you know what, we, we the, the state came uh, and, and the kid maybe had problems at school, it sounds like, yes. and then the state gets involved and they say, he's got to go to one of these facilities. What's the... Um, What's the relationship when we're talking about, you know, private facilities, I can, you know, it, 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 it seems a little bit more of a direct line, right? The parents are at the, the wit's end. They don't know what to do. They go to, uh, you know, they get some advice from uh, somebody and uh, and they send their kids there without really necessarily knowing, you know, what's up behind the curtain, I guess. Um, when the state's involved, like how much of the relationship between the state and, you know, Child Protective Services, I think, sort of cuts both ways, it, it seems to me. Obviously, it's very important in certain situations to protect children. Uh, but I also imagine that there are moneyed interests who step in and will lobby the state, will develop relationships with politicians in the state who then say to Child Protective Services, like, this is where the, the we're gonna we're gonna contract with the, this outfit, and that's where the funnel's gonna. Oh yeah, the go. big operators, and we always ask for this in discovery in our cases. The big operators wine and dine politicians. They wine and dine people in the juvenile justice system. They wine and dine the people at Child Protective Services. So yeah, so you send them to, send them to our place. Yeah, that happens. That's common. All right. So what is um, what are the different theories in which you go in? And 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 sue and what is it that you're uh, what ends up being the remedy? Primarily, the cases I've handled over the year have been personal injury cases, and those range anywhere from uh, serious injury as a result of assaults. I mean, but it's got to be for us to handle. I mean, obviously, serious injury because I get calls all the time, Sam, on these cases, and sadly, I can't help them because cost of litigation versus return, we just can't do it. Um, so we think some of the part of bringing awareness to this is hopefully going to help change the whole system. But um, I've had cases from bro broken bones, broken teeth, um, all the way up to just horrible, horrible sexual abuse cases from gang rape to a roommate raping um, their their roommate like this, this little boy uh, up to death cases um, with assaults from um, – staff causing these causing these problems and suicide cases it's just a wide variety of things going on in these facilities and in addition to that claims that we bring or i mean they put them in isolation for untold un ungodly amounts of time sometimes two weeks at a time they'll put them in there and barely feed them um, and won't let them use the restroom properly uh, just horrible things they use unlawful restraints um on these children and they say restraints, but to me, they're outright re assaults because they're not trained in proper restraints. You're not supposed to restrain one of these children unless they're a harm to themselves or a harm to others. And they just, if they're not happy with the child, they'll, they'll take the child down. And, and oftentimes they're hurt like this. What's crazy in these cases and we hear about it all the time is staff in these facilities, if they don't like a child or if a child's not doing what they're supposed to be doing, or um, they will, put a bounty out on that child and basically say, and they call it putting snacks on his head or snacks on our head. They give extra privileges to other children, um, give them extra snacks, whatever to basically Go beat, up, you, yeah, oh, geez. beat up another child. And I, sometimes in these places, discipline, they leave the discipline up to the other children. It's crazy. People who haven't watched the program, I highly suggest you watch it because this is happening all over the country and it's kind of starting to get the attention it deserves. Are there instances where they're uh, prescribing drugs? I mean, it could be uh, uh, to uh, the children as a way of basically, you know, um, uh, drugs that aren't necessarily called for, but will, uh, you know, keep them, uh, you know, more oh, yeah. manageable. Oh, yeah. When I see the medication charts for my clients, it's just how can a child be on this this much medication and even be awake? And they're not. I mean, they're zombies. I mean, they just that. There, they, they, this is, seems to me to be sort of uh, there's a parallel with uh, nursing homes. 
uh, it seems to me, where, you know, it's behind a curtain. You don't know what's going to happen. You, you you put your parents in there and they're, they're understaffed more often than not because they want to make profits. And the way they do that is instead of like having, I don't know what the, the proper staffing would be, one to five patients, it's one to 30 patients. And they take care of the other patients by basically just giving them enough uh, whatever uh, drugs it is, antipsychotics or uh, other drugs to basically make them completely docile so they don't absolutely, really require absolutely. the same level of care. And like you said, there's a, while, a wall of si silence in these places. I mean, it's people when that's that's what we try to do in all these cases. Every case I get gets a lot of media attention and we want to shed a light on what's going on in these places because they need sunshine and they're finally starting to get it to some extent. They're, they're making children in these places do their landscaping, their maintenance, their cleaning. So I brought, um, along with some other attorneys, forced labor uh, and child labor cases, class actions against some of these operators because that's going on in a lot of these places as well. Is there a, are there state regulatory agencies? Are there federal regulatory? Are there licensing that, requirements? Like what? That's, that's a great point because, and I'll give you Alabama, for example, even though I'm familiar with, with a lot of them now, because there has been a lot of change in the laws that affect these facilities. Alabama, for instance, has a wonderful written law, wonderfully written laws on this topic, but there's no enforcement. There's no teeth to it. It's not happening. Um, and we're actually in the legislature right now trying to bring change with Levin Papantonio and others. We're we're going to the legislature saying, put some teeth into this. Um, you know, Paris Hilton's involved in this movement, and she's helped get the laws changed to strengthen it in Utah, in Montana, in uh, Oregon, and a few other states. They're making good change. Now, federally, uh, there's something called SICA right now, Stop Institutional Child Abuse Act. Now, Paris Hilton is is supporting this. It's a bipartisan support right now. You got Tommy Tuberville from my state who um, is supporting it along with Democrats. And um, that's that's another whole issue for yeah, another bet, day yeah, on bet, that. Yeah. But um, so that's a bipartisan issue. But, you know, I, don't, I, I hope it passes because it brings awareness to the situation. Paris has been up to Capitol Hill talking about it. She was here at MTMP six months ago. We were up talking about it. Uh, but what that's going to do is kind of just form some work groups for best practices and make these places be more transparent in what they do and share numbers. But there's share, no agency. But there's going to be in. nothing right. There's no national law that really regulates. So at best, it's that's a start. Is there what would be the model for? And, and then I want to get to sort of the legal theories that you're using to get to to say at the very least hold these places accountable and then hopefully make it somewhat unprofitable i mean that's sort of the, the 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 only thing that you guys are able to do is sort of like you know uh, uh almost like uh you know uh, i mean i've heard attorneys like yourself referred to as almost like private ags on some level coming in trying to change the industry by by reshaping the incentive structure here but if you were going to have an agency that would police these uh, uh these um uh you know facilities what would it be modeled on? Would it be the sort of like, I don't know, like a EPA enforcement or labor enforcement or, or FDA or, 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 or is there anything out there that would provide a, a, the appropriate model for this? Well, I, I don't know about the model, but what could happen in our state is DHR, which is family and child and family services in that state. They are, inspect these places every four months. They're supposed to. And if they're not meeting expectations, not meeting what they're supposed to be doing, not educating children like they're supposed to be doing, if there's rampant abuse and neglect, pull their license. Right. That's how you do it. That's how the state does it. But like you were saying on our end, I mean, the, whatever theories we're using, and it's a, there are a lot of them in these cases, I mean, we're going after money damages in every single one of them. And we've had good success doing that. I mean, and I think that's the way to bring the rapid change is to hit them in the pocketbook over and over again. And then either put them out of business or they're going to change their ways. They're going to start hiring qualified people. They claim in our cases that these are medical providers, medical facilities. That's how they always defend these cases and say that this, these are medical malpractice cases. Tell me how they're medical malpractice cases when one of my cases, a lady for no reason who's an employee at a facility, throws down my client 
because she had called the police saying, I'm getting abused in here. Other children are getting abused in here. Please come help us. Well, the police are on their way. My client's just walking around the room. This is all on video. And a client and a worker comes up and tackles her, throws her to the ground, and the rest of the residents come beat the hell out of her, oh, including geez. breaking her jaw and pull and, and dislocating her shoulder. And they claim that's a medical malpractice case. Our state Supreme Court agreed with them and said that is a medical malpractice case. This happened last week. We were devastated by it because we had another case that's very similar, a suicide case in one of these facilities. They said it was not a medical malpractice case. Those two don't die. So we're still to the point where we can appeal it again. So we haven't, you know, we're still in court. Alabama State uh, Supreme Court, is that an elected position? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. It's elected position. And that's where, you know, the unfortunate. There's a lot of influence, I would imagine, in those races and interference in those races. And uh, you got funders and, uh, uh, you know, I think. Well, I mean, we had the IVF come out, uh, unfortunate opinion, you know, come out a few weeks ago that got national attention. So what are the big sort of uh, theories in which you're uh, in, in, and we should say, like, in general, um, these type of it, with, with a lot of the plaintiff's attorneys here, almost uh, all, all it is. There is a statutory requirement or and the private AGs, uh, if you will, go in and use that statutory. Uh, and, and basically, they function as a third party coming in and saying, my client is not being uh, treated or uh, the service they're providing is not following the law. And this is how you get like a, a civil judgment. What are the theories uh, of these cases that you use? Right. In, uh, our, in our injury cases and wrongful death cases, sex abuse cases, we that's just straight tort law, straight negligence, wantonness, and intentional or reckless conduct. Now, the, the, the interesting theory that we're coming at them with now is these education cases that I briefly discussed in Alabama. And we're kind of using a trial balloon in Alabama to see what happens, but we're suing the Department of Education, Department of Child and Family Services, DHR in Alabama, and the heads of those facility, heads of those entities, um, claiming that they're violating the American with Disabilities Act, which they are. The Department of Justice came down and said that children who live in these facilities that the state has placed, children that the state has placed in these facilities, um, are not receiving adequate education. They're not receiving education as their peers who are not in these facilities are receiving. They're not even evaluating these children when they are admitted into one of these facilities. What grade level are you on? Uh, are you able to go to public school? Um, oftentimes, the DOJ said it. the vast majority of the children in these facilities could be going to public school. I mean, just they're not these aren't bad kids. You know, they're not a threat to themselves or others or they'd be at a lockdown facility. These aren't lockdown facilities. Um, they have some behavioral problems sometimes. Then there are a lot of kids with behavioral problems yes. that are currently in public and private schools across the country. These children, and that's what we're arguing is it's in the education they are getting in these facilities is pathetic. It's pitiful. There's no uh, there's worksheets. I mean, there'll be the, we were in federal court last week in Montgomery for a district judge. And he said, what age people or kids are in these facilities? Well, you'd have kindergartners in there and seniors. Well, how are you, you know, ask defense counsel, how, how do you educate them? I mean, that's a good question because. Do you have kindergarten teachers and, uh, no, and, and no, no. And they don't even have certified teachers. And this is all that this isn't lawyers speak. This is what the DOJ said. They said these t teachers, they're not certified by the state. Um, they don't have opportunities to do extracurricular activities. They don't have gyms. They don't have things like that. They work off the same worksheet, regardless of what grade le level they're in. And these children are being stunted for life. I mean, we, our clients all, um, you know, it's, it's affected them for the rest of their lives because they've gotten so far behind. And if they had to receive the education that they're entitled to, um, they, so just so I'm clear, they, uh, in admitting them. Right. They are categorized as having some a form disability. of disability, and then they fall under the rubric of federal law, exactly. which says that um, if uh, it's established that uh, this child has a disability, whether it's uh, emotional or mental or physical for that matter, mm -hmm. there's still an obligation to provide them with the same quality of public education as non-disabled uh, uh, children. Exactly. And that's not happening in, in those instances. 
And so what is the remedy for that? Is it, I mean, obviously you're, you're like, how do you determine what the damages are in that situation? Yeah, well, we've hired vocational experts who are going to go in just like in, you know, uh, catastrophic car accidents when, you know, products liability cases, someone's a quadriplegic, they'll have a vocational expert come in. And I've had those cases too, where they'll basically evaluate what's it going to cost for the rest of his, his or her life or the care that it will cost them to survive and live. And it's kind of like this, what would this child, if, you know, average out with children his age that were given that opportunity and these vocational experts right. can do all that and say, this child would have made this kind of money and that. And we're also, you know, we we're at motion to dismiss stage right now. And that's what the hearing was on last week, you know, whether or not we get to go to court, basically. And the judge, we've got to amend some things, but he indicated we are going to, the case is going to be valid and going to go forward. And once he does rule for us, knock on wood, we're going to, I mean, we've had, we've got six clients now. This affects thousands of children in Alabama. So we're inevitably, we've got, we've got a lot of cases in the holster. So if we want theory... to get it, ultimately we want to get it made, a change made. Now for our clients, we want to get them compensated as well. But I think when the state sees this amount of lawsuits coming at them, and based on the DOJ coming after them as well, uh, they're going to have to straighten up. They're going to have to change this. Will, it's going to cost them a lot of money. Will uh, now this is the is yours the first case to 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 turn on this theory? Yes. yes. And so, in the event that the court finds that um, it, it, they make two essential broad rulings, right? The first one is: is this a theory under which a an action can be brought? And then the second is establishing what the damages right, are right. and whether they're culpable because the uh, for what the school is doing. But once they establish that this is a theory that can be brought, it opens up all these other cases. Would that also happen nationally? Or, you know, I would imagine on some level, you've got a lawyer who's going to go like, this is happening in Alabama, I'm in Massachusetts, or I'm in New York, or I, wherever it is, it's going to be in my brief. And they will um, they they will present that brief. Um, uh, they'll use it in other uh, cases. What would be the damages in that situation? Right, the damages, and 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 if we have success in this case, it certainly will set precedent for other for this to be a theory in other states. But because the DOJ came to Alabama, that kind of made it simpler, so we could parallel their findings in in our case. Um, what we're trying to obtain through these suits is for the individual clients, money damages for basically we'll, we'll have someone come, an expert come evaluate if these children had been given the opportunities that they're required to be given under the law, their success, you know, and then and, and these these experts, they have all the tables as to, you know, certain grade level student with certain grades, you know, this is his trajectory. Um, and then once that's stifled or stunted by the state, in our case, and by the facilities, who are the owners of these facilities, um, we'll be able to extrapolate um, basically lost income over the year. And there's some things we can't quantify, but right. these experts are good at what they do. Um, but ultimately, if we're successful in these cases, if we get past the motion to dismiss stage, um, there's going to be a flood of of cases. Um, we've only brought six kind of as the test case, but thousands of children across Alabama were damaged as a result of this. And lastly, is the DOJ, um, are they involved in other states? They came down to Alabama based on specific complaints. Um, I don't know if they're expanding that or not. They, I, there has not been a resolution yet between the DOJ and the state of Alabama in these cases. So they're probably going to start following our cases because if we're, I mean, I said it earlier, um, this is going to cost the state a whole lot of money when we start having a whole lot of clients following these cases. And if the state does not want to get into a position either of discovery, they don't want us getting into their records to see what's really going on in these cases, who's getting paid, how they're getting paid, why they're paying these certain facilities to do this, why they're not requiring them to do what they're supposed to be doing under the law. So it's problems for everybody. And it's going to cost the state a whole lot of money when we have thousands of lawsuits starting to pile up. And once they realize that, it's going to be cheaper for them to actually yeah, um, yeah. hold these exactly uh, evaluate the children when they go into these facilities so you can they'll, they'll be able to tell can this child go to public school can he at least go to public school for a part of the day things like that and the interesting thing about this is if it, again going back to that show the program on netflix 
this facility, which again is kind of a private pay where parents are paying money to send their children to Ivy Ridge Academy, came out in that documentary. These kids, and it shows them they're getting their diploma and they're walking when they graduate the program. They weren't they they weren't certified by anyone. The state of New York did not certify this place at all. Those diplomas were, were worth nothing. Zero. Wow. Zip. It's a scam. I mean, this whole industry is a scam, and it's hurting our most vulnerable children. And I'm so happy that it's getting the, like you. I appreciate you covering this, Sam, because the more attention this gets when people watch the program, the show on Netflix, it's going to open their eyes. It's going to infuriate people, and it's already happening. It's on Twitter. Uh, there are other documentaries out there. There are podcasts out there on this topic now. So it's it's uh, satisfying to see what I've been doing for 20 years and been seeing for 20 years kind of come into the light. Uh, Tommy James, uh, Tommy James Law will um... – Put a link uh, to your firm, and uh, if we have any other information, maybe you can give me uh, afterwards where people can get more information on this on this problem. Uh, and of course, uh, we'll we'll link uh, to uh, the program on on Netflix. Can I add one one more? Sure. Thing? Yes. There is a great uh, organization who advocates for these children as well called Unsilenced. Unsilenced.org. I believe it could be Unsilenced, but Meg Applegate is the CEO of Unsilenced. She's a survivor of one of these places, and they have a database of thousands of these facilities. You can look at look up the facilities. Uh, it has articles, lawsuits, uh, reports on the facilities, the camps, whatever. So people can do some vetting before yes. they yeah. in, engage. I, in well, that's what people ask me. You know, what should I do? You know, parents. You know, what do you recommend if you can't, you know, my child is having all these problems, you know, and are there any good facilities out there? You know, what else are they supposed to do? What else are we supposed to do? I said, I'm not smart enough to answer that question, but this isn't what you need to do. Right. But go to Unsilence, too, um, and, and, and you'll be able to get a lot of information on this topic and you can help advocate if, we'll, you, if you want to get involved. We'll link to that, too. Awesome. Uh, Tommy James, thank you so much. I really Thanks, appreciate Sam. it. I appreciate you having me.